everyone and welcome to this next Talking Together Mental Health and Wellbeing event hosted by the IMECI in collaboration with the Royal Aeronautical Society and the IET. Today we have myself, Joshua Thompson-Smith, a member of the IMECI, and Babic Bat, a member of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and we are both young professionals at Rolls-Royce. We are very pleased today to be talking with Professor Jonathan Cooper, and President of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and Sir Brian Burridge, who is the current CEO of the Royal Aeronautical Society. It's really excellent that today we can get some senior perspective from the STEM industry on topics such as loneliness, dealing with disappointment and overcoming uncertainty in professional life, as you both now work together, but you do have different backgrounds and perspectives. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce both of you and allow you to um, let our members know a little bit more about yourself. So we'll start with Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Um, as Josh has said, my name is Jonathan Cooper. I'm the president of the Royal Aeronautical Society this year. In my day job, I'm a professor of aerospace universe, uh, engineering at the University of Bristol. So working closely with the aerospace industry, trying to develop new technologies for eventually zero emissions flight. Brian? Thanks, Jonathan. Brian Burridge. I'm the chief exec of the Royal Aeronautical Society and have been for two years now. Um, my real um, DNA is that of a pilot. I was a military pilot for uh, close on 30 odd years, 39 years, I think. Um, I then did 10 years in Leonardo, so um, deep in the aerospace industry, a couple of years consulting, and then I find myself here. Excellent. That's a uh really good to get, get a little bit of an introduction. So what we'll do is we're going to go through a few questions with you and it's going to be really excellent to, to have a, a get through, go through your answers. So um, let's start with, with the first one. So how has your attitude towards mental health changed from when you started to your career to, uh, to the positions you, uh, you find yourselves now with the society? So, so that's an interesting question because uh, way back in the last millennium when I started work, you, you never talked about mental health. You might have talked about people being stressed but it certainly never got mentioned. Um, certainly over the years, I've known colleagues who you know, have become overloaded and have eventually have had to take three, six months off work, which I guess would be you know, a mental health problem um, due to overwork. Uh, not being able to say no, I think is a big problem. Um, I think with the sort of the advent of digital technologies and too many emails and social media, that, that perhaps has got much worse. But I think we're much more aware of it. So, um, and certainly from my personal perspective, I think I'm a lot more aware as I'm ooh, getting into my 50s now, um, trying to look after myself and, and making sure that I, you know, don't become overloaded and, and overstressed. Brian? Yeah, I, uh, I agree with um, Jonathan's view. But. Um, I'm infinitely old, you see, and uh, I well remember the norm, certainly in British society, uh, when I was growing up, was this real sense of stiff upper lip, mm. because the culture mm. was, the nation had come through the Second World War, a lot of privations, so people learned not to complain, as it were, and put up with things, and it wasn't really until, I guess, the late 70s, where uh, we started to hear the term burnout, uh, and exactly as Jonathan says, mm. this sense of um, being overrun by all the uh, aspects, both professional and personal life, uh, which suddenly, I don't know, seemed to increase some of it about technology, some of it about expectations. And uh, that was the point, I think, where, um, where people generally uh, felt that uh, there was a hazard at play here. For me personally, um, I was caused to take a behavioral science course way back in the uh, early 70s. And that really aligned my thinking as to human motivation, how people tick, and the sort of stresses that can build up. And one of the problems, uh, certainly, as, uh, you know, as then a military officer, we had a can do spirit. It wasn't done to say no. And many of my colleagues who uh, reached the senior level that I did and then retired said, going into um, civilian life, it was very difficult to say no, because you were used to uh, just accepting it and cracking on. And that's uh, quite an interesting comment on, uh, on the way we end up. But certainly my, uh, my personal view 
and my uh, sensitivity to mental health issues has changed dramatically over the course of my career. That's, that's really, really quite encouraging to hear. I think, on the contrary, I've only been in the real engineering world working for about five years now. But even in the five years, I've seen a massive change in the perception of, of mental health, being able to talk about mental health a bit more openly. Mm. And I think it's important to do so because, as you mentioned, burnout. Burnout is something that is a end result of not being able to talk about mental health. It's, it's something that you don't want to be able to get to. And having an open space, a safe space to be able to talk about, oh, I'm feeling a bit more stressed today, my workload is too high, whatever it might be, prevents burnout from happening as regularly as it might have done in the past. Um, which is, like I said, is very encouraging. Even in the five years that I've been at Rolls-Royce, we have started many mental health initiatives. It might be as small as, let's just talk about it over lunch, or it might be a little bit bigger in terms of what are the effects, what are the symptoms of poor mental health? What can we do in the office, outside of the office to improve mental health? And I guess you also touched on the, the digital age taking over social media in particular doesn't help with people's mm. mental health. There is so much stimulus nowadays that it's very easy to just constantly be turned on um, and, and not be able to go away from a screen even at night. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the second question then is, it's good to hear that you've been a bit more open about talking about mental health. Um, in terms of your own mental health, where would you put yourself currently? Uh, would you say you're currently in good mental health or has the pandemic slowly drained away any optimism that you had at the start of 2020. Shall I start? Uh, or, yeah, let oh. me... Well, Brian, yeah, go on, Brian. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me kick off. And uh, um, I mean, for my part, I'd say um, right now, uh, my mental health is pretty solid. Um, I'm essentially an outdoors person. And so I, I have a natural cadence between um, the ability to use the outdoors as a de-stressor, if you like, uh, in spring, summer and autumn. But in winter, it's very difficult. Uh, overlay uh, the impact of restrictions due to the pandemic over that and uh, my willingness, motivation to get outdoors has increased dramatically and has really, really helped. So as, as a matter of discipline, I um, I was trying to get some outside exercise either on my bike or running or whatever every day um, and sometimes fail, but that's... <laughs> um, from a professional point of view, it's been a, a very difficult period because um, for the, from a society point of view, we've had to downsize, make people redundant, which is never pleasant. And that has a direct impact, not only on their sense of mental well-being, but on the remaining crew as well. Um, and uh, that was tough. And now we're approaching the sunlit uplands because like many organizations, we have been able to leverage the the value of doing things differently, specifically um, digital delivery, for example. And we find now we're reaching all corners of the globe, which is always what we've wanted to do. So this, this has turned into an opportunity and that's positive. The one thing I really miss is interaction. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of bouncing ideas off each other as you do when you go to the coffee machine or you know just uh, in a semi form brainstorm or whatever it's the human interaction which uh, certainly to people like me as managers is, is what really motivates you because that's how you get the best out of people and by that sort of interaction you can get a feel for how they're feeling and um, this is perhaps a big difference uh, over the length of my career where um, it was assumed that people didn't have feelings, they just uh, would get on with their job. Um, very different now, quite rightly, and this um, human interaction is a way you do tap into that. Jonathan. I, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, it's the, I've been at the uni three days since March 
uh, a couple of days at Airbus. So again, it's that, you know, chats in the corridor, over, uh, meeting people over a cup of coffee. I mean, that's what really I, I miss. Um, you know, the, the students have had quite a stressful time adapting, but also the academic staff in preparing all the lectures in a digital manner. You know, I would argue actually that uh, this 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 cohort undergoing teaching at the minute are have got more material to be able to uh, to access. Um, it's the structure of the day I miss. So it sounds daft, but I miss my my commute because that's like a start to the working day and an end. So I, I normally do a park and ride into the centre of Bristol. And there's a sort of like people you meet on the bus, not every day, but from time to time. And, you know, I get up and I go to spare room and I turn on Zoom or whatever. And I, you know, it just goes on and on until endless meetings. So you know, and there've been a few weeks where I, I've sort of realised at the end of the week that I, I put the bins out on a Wednesday, but haven't really been out much. So it's it's trying to force force yourself to get out. You know, I you know my whole family unfortunately caught COVID six seven weeks ago, but you know, luckily we're all bright and well again now. But um, you know that that has sort of knocked things out as well. So I think the the long term effects of COVID from a mental viewpoint are are still going to take a while but you know i can't wait to to travel and go to meetings and again and uh, won't moan about the you know the traffic on the m5 for or m4 for a while definitely totally agree with that yeah it's uh it seems like night seems to switch to day too quickly these times you know yeah. especially in the winter so uh, definitely we need to get outside so brian uh, take mm. a leaf out of your book getting outside uh, having a walk definitely it's always good for mental health and well-being so the next sort of phase that the interview starts to move towards kind of your career and especially as young professionals who might be watching this are definitely anchored towards seniors to to try and think about when have you seen disappointment in your career because it's natural we'll all face it um i have at some point babbitt i'm not sure you have too so the question is you know what is your biggest disappointment you face in your career and how do you deal with it and this is around kind of aligning with the amount of young engineers that may have lost summer placements graduate schemes um, due to COVID and are left disappointed. What's your advice? Uh, how would you reference that? So, you know, thinking about this question, I, you know, I wouldn't say there's one major disappointment. I mean, life is full of wins and and some losses, and hopefully a few more wins than losses. But you know, from not getting to the university that I wanted to get to, um, you know, I apply for grants and I get some of them. I don't get some of them. I've applied for promotions and other jobs, and. Um, you know, easy to say, but you've just got to sort of, you know, brush yourself down, think about, you know, have, did I, you know, apply myself for that application or job as well as I could do? Did I prepare myself? But, you know, you play sport or anything, you're, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. And um, you, you've got to be prepared for that. Um, for young engineers, you, okay, it's, it's, it's really tough times, but you, you, you're not going to get anywhere without, um, you know, applying for things, you know, look at, you know, could I develop my networks better? Could I, you know, perhaps slightly change the direction of things that I've applied for, but, but, but keep trying. Don't, don't just say, Oh, you know, I give up and, and life's not going to come to you. Uh, that's, that's one of the things you got to go out, push yourself forward. Do you agree with that, Brian? Or Yeah. I mean, I've certainly, um, uh, life comes with the ups and downs and we do have to develop a certain type of resilience to overcome that. But um, I have great sympathy for uh, mm. the generation right now who are either just starting an undergraduate course or graduating. Um, and I can relate that uh, to my own experience. I, I was through advanced training um, flying training, so you know, postgraduate type stuff, and I lost my medical. Cat. I had 18 months where I couldn't fly, and that seemed like a lifetime in your early 20s. In fact, um, I was able to put it to good use, became an ops manager, learned the new skill, actually um, developed confidence in another area, if you like. But I relate that to what's going on now because uh, the, there's no doubt that the impact on the aerospace industry 
uh, is going to be significant for a significant length of time. Um, who knows how long, but if aviation recovers by 2024, which is what we currently reckon, then you know the lag in building up production rates, et cetera, will take some time. Balance sheets a week, um, producing new airplane designs, et cetera, will follow on. So there is certainly a lot. Um, when you're... Uh, just graduating, a lull of five years seems like a lifetime. I mean, it is significant time. So I, I, I recognize that as, and the society recognizes that as one of the great perils that's facing us um, because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I think, Jonathan, you said it really well that disappointment is something you will face in your professional career, but it's also just a part of life. And the main thing to take away is don't be disheartened to the point at which you give up. Learn, learn from Le this learn, learn from it. Learn from things that go go wrong. Um, yeah, you know, and adapt, and, adapt to the change yes. that that may come your way. And yeah, I've just come out. Of, yeah, I've Go just ahead. come out of a seminar from the ATI where they're talking about failing fast. So okay, yeah. that's not in a personal thing, but you you've got to apply that to yourself. You should be reflective and and assessing where you're going. You know, am I you know am I doing as well as I, as I could do? But you're we're not all going to become top of the pile. It's, yeah, it's true. And as, as cliche as it may sound for every door that closes, I'm sure if you work hard, oh. develop your network, put yourself into a good position, yeah. a few more doors will open. And but then, there uh, are, you know, there are opportunities from, you know, the whole whole crisis. So I, I think the whole zero emissions has been yeah. driven up the agenda very quickly. And part of that is people looking at, well, what's going to happen next? And we've got the start, you know, a, uh, developing the technologies for for zero emission aircraft yeah and i think the, the next question kind of follows on what brian was saying yes there's a lull in the aviation industry um arguably across many engineering industries um but there's also exciting stuff happening on the horizon um and now is an interesting time for graduates who obviously they're thinking very short term um, as opposed to what aviation will be like in the next five to 10 years. And they might be a bit hesitant to join the engineering industry or STEM industry in, in particular. Is there any point in your career in the past where you've experienced maybe um, some situation where you've thought, mm, is engineering really right for me? Did I pick the right career path? And how did you overcome that little voice in the back of your head yeah, um, I wanted to be a pilot ever since I was about eight years old. And that sort of drove me uh, in a particular direction. And uh, I read theoretical physics uh, as an undergraduate at Manchester. And um, I remember in my second year having severe doubt as to uh, whether this was relevant to me, um, solving fourth order differential equations on the back of a um, uh, have sort of limited appeal after a time and um, so I started I did I started to look at other courses and I, I actually fancied being an architect I always said if I could not be a pilot I'd be an architect but then um, fate takes a turn and the university offered um, at the end of our second year, the ability to, stu uh, to study electronic engineering related more uh, to computer science and the new devices that were coming on stream. And this is against the backdrop of a vast acceleration in the technologies that were applying to aerospace. And, you know, that period, uh, the day I went to university, uh, someone flew at Mach 7.62, and 20 years earlier, we only flew at Mach 1. So, you know, all the technologies around that, the Apollo um, series, Concorde, all this stuff was going on, was seen as exciting. But it somehow I had to understand how it applied to you and how you could apply yourself to it. And I think that was it was lucky that uh, I had that break, so I did a joint on us and uh, the rest is history. But it is, uh, you know, the intrinsic motivation has to be there because it can be bloody hard work to make progress. And uh, there is no doubt that um, if you look at it today, as you've uh, indicated, 
phenomenal group of technologies coming at us in the fourth industrial revolution. Aerospace will be the biggest recipient of change of any other sector, as well as that suddenly or not suddenly, but progressively the space sector is mm. really taking off. And uh, uh, here we have the Artemis series coming up with a, um, another uh, set of moon landings, including landing a woman on the moon. Um, and that's only a waypoint in going to Mars. So, you know, this huge excitement that uh, was around in the period when I was growing up is repeated now. And I think you can't beat the fascination of being part of that. Mm. I, I totally agree, Brian. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the getting involved in exciting projects is, is I think, is what drives most engineers. Um, you know, I, oh, goodness, you, you talk about fate and, and life. You know, originally, I wanted to do maths, double maths and economics at school for A-levels and was categorically told, no, you do double maths, you must do physics. And, okay, I start, I originally studied maths and, hey, I'm an engineer, but I wouldn't have been allowed in without without the physics. So, so, so some, you know, life throws up opportunities, the uh, things you, you couldn't envisage. Um, I didn't really know what an engineer was before I applied for A-levels or, or university either, which was, I don't know, a sign of the times perhaps. Um, but yes, I I didn't mean to become an academic. You know, I, I, I did my degree and thought, ooh, being a student's fun. And then I did some aero engineering courses and got persuaded to come and, you know, do some work on ground vibration and flight flutter testing. So so that was interesting. And then I met some people at the, the RE Farnborough um and then oh why have you thought about being a lecturer and I, I i i like the teaching side i don't like marking but i like i like the the teaching part of being an academic um and i guess oh every five or so years i'd sort of put my toe in the water saying you know do i want to duck out and go into industry or do i want to uh you know would they have me and um but, uh, you know, I've always found more and more interesting projects. You know, I do a lot of work with industry, but not actually working in industry. And, and that's, that's, that's a nice balance. So um, I don't know. Did I mean to be an academic? No. But, you know, would I have changed things? I, I don't think so. So there we go. That's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I actually share a similar thing. I, was, I wanted to do English literature with maths and physics at A-levels. My school said uh, it wasn't possible with the timetables. So uh, sometimes, yeah, it's quite early on that you have that, that path set. Um, so, yeah, no, re really interesting perspectives. So, uh, so our next uh, question is uh, maybe a bit more one towards what you do to kind of wind down, because that's really important for well-being. I do running golf, watch Arsenal, which can be sometimes more stress. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, the, the question is, what are your favourite hobbies to do to wind down and step away from the professional environment? Um, and is there anything you do each day that you feel benefits your mental health and well-being? I, 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 I have an acoustic guitar, which I, I strum a few chords or more than a few chords <laughs> on from time to time. Um, I would maintain I can sing better than Neil Young or Bob Dylan. So perhaps your younger viewers won't know who they are. But anyhow, um, <laughs> so I find that as quite a stress relief. Um, I used to play lots and lots of cricket, but moving to Bristol, the ground was getting too far away. So I... Uh, you know, to pick the ball up, not not where the ground was. So um, I went back to something I'd done as a sort of Boy Scout as a dinghy sailing. So, uh, but unfortunately that's been hit by COVID. Although in, in theory this weekend, I'm driving the rescue boat. Uh, we just about get around the regulations. And that's a great thing because you're, 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 every sail is different. You're trying to make sure, well, you're not capsizing, but then have I got the sail set right? And how am I doing in the race? And uh those, those are probably the two two main things. I, I'm I'm lucky to live within two minute walk of sort of open fields. So yes, going for a run, perhaps a bike ride. But uh, I don't know. Covid Covid has sort of um, constrained time in a strange way, and it's it's always a battle to find time to get out. Brian. Yeah, that's uh, there's a lot of commonality there. I, I'm. Uh... I've got a bass guitar, so we could form a band. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> Josh, can you play the drums? The, um, <laughs> the violin, actually. Yeah, but there is similarity. Cool. I mean, I, I, um, as I said, I, I like to uh, 
uh, to get outside. I mean, A, you get away from a screen and B, um, a lot of researchers said how um, valuable it is for your um, your mental health just to be amongst trees, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm lucky enough to live by the River Thames, so um, I, uh, I make sure once a week I do a dawn cycle ride so I can see the birds and things coming to life and take my coffee and a piece of toast and sit on a bench and just watch it uh, and that's very um uh, that's a great release uh, and i also have a boat and so um luckily during covid i can spend uh, a lot of time on the boat suitably social socially distance from my crew um and uh, that's just a great uh, change of environment great switch off and it's very relaxing uh, people who um, chug up and down rivers and canals know that uh, suddenly everything changes to four miles an hour from the speed of your life otherwise mm. and that's uh, really good for cleansing the brain and just uh, relaxing <laughs> nice good to hear that you've got not just one or two but a long list of activities that you can use to to help wind down and i think for all of the listeners um it just goes to show that whether you're five years into your career or at very, very top levels, the work-life balance in STEM will always allow you to have this time to wind down, whether it's a cycle ride or, or a run or going on a boat <laughs> or joining a band, which uh, well. <laughs> we'll see. We'll talk offline. We'll talk offline. <laughs> the next but question. No, we talk, <laughs> sorry, just to butt in, but we, you know, we talked about burnout before and again, doing doing something totally different you know that's and again i say i missed the commute and that was almost like okay i've stopped work now now mm -hmm. being an academic you can always do more applications write more papers do stuff but you're just gonna say no stop um yeah. and, and do it, doing other activities is is important that's one of the hardest things uh, because certainly for me i permanently overestimate my ability to to shift work if you like and uh, mm. and then it, uh, it it can become uh it can generate a, a, a sense of anxiety when you think you're going to fall off a cliff edge so you know really you've just got to get away from it and reset recalibrate mm. your expectations about yourself and it's a horrible loop because i've got friends in industry with you know before covid playing football um as part of the team some people a lot of the time would say oh i just haven't got time but if you don't give your time to give you that wind down, actually you'll be less productive. And I've read some papers on it, but, you know, productivity gain by yeah. um, giving yourself some time to look after your own mental health and well-being, whether that's playing football. Mm. Or but you see people drums. say, oh, I get into work at eight o'clock in the morning and I work to eight o'clock at night. I'd and be less productive. Look at, look at all these hours I've done, but it's like, yeah. uh, and I think it's something like, uh, you know, colleagues in Germany or France seem to be, a, you know, do an awful amount of really good work, but they just seem to be a lot more, balance than we are in the yeah. the uk mm, totally agree mm. brilliant thanks for your insights there next question is a bit different then so as two uh, very experienced people that have reached quite high up in your respective uh, departments um what we are finding especially with with new graduates is that um people from sort of minority backgrounds, non-traditional backgrounds, uh, people with slightly more diverse ways um, of, of living seem to be, like I said, in the minority and they don't have a lot of people um, to look up to in higher positions, uh, even in the mid-management positions. Mm. Um, so it, it can be quite easy for them to maybe feel a bit lonely, feel like there isn't anyone that looks like them that they can achieve to be like. Yeah. What could organizations such as the Royal Aero Society, Anarchy, or various companies do um, to make the work environment a little bit more inclusive to people who want to be part of it going forward? Yeah, um, it's a very important topic. Um, and the title of this series, Talking Together, is really at the root of it. And so um organizations particularly professional organizations have to be the catalyst that allows that to happen and that's easy to say a lot of that is about something we might call companionship if you know mm -hmm. um which is certainly the case of the way it would look 
for a branch of the society or one of our specialist groups. Uh, but the enabling that is the fundamental need to address the blockers. And um, we know what the blockers are. There's a very good program that the Royal Academy of Engineering have put together, which is a framework for increasing your appeal in terms of diversity and inclusivity. And I think that uh, my personal view is that it's not that there are bad people who make other people feel unwelcome. It's just that we are probably riven with unconscious bias. And mm -hmm. that is a significant danger for organizations of the nature of the Royal Aeronautical Society. We've been around 150 years. So our culture and our processes and procedures, which are kind of embedded in our whole being, are, um, are absolutely at the root of unconscious bias because um, they just are not attuned to the breadth of community that we now try to attract. And it's important to us uh, 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 to attract a broad and diverse community because you, I mean, apart from the fact that there's an ethical issue to it, but the difference of perspectives you get when you're solving a problem with people who are very different mm. per se is remarkable. And the danger is that if you don't have that breadth of perspective available to you, you tread a very narrow path and ultimately uh, a downward spiral. But it's interesting to see how that's changed over the years because I can remember uh, 25 years ago, if we were uh, advertising for airline pilots, you'd talk about um, join this group of like-minded people, um, which <laughs> is an innate barrier mm -hmm. and actually in a sense uh, represents the very heart of unconscious bias so it's breaking down all those things and as i say i have infinite faith in the human spirit only in a very few cases do people um, uh, willingly put up barriers etc but a lot of it is just something that has to be recognized and washed out of people recognize for what it is and what it looks like from someone else's perspective so you only get that understanding by bringing a diverse group together and talking which is where mm. i began so i would i would totally agree with you there and and in terms of unconscious bias you know i've done quite a few courses recently and and you know i'd like to think that i'm a you know I, i'm not biased and then you start looking at these things and and sort of looking at you, you from the outside and you'll go well okay that's it's 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 to, to, the first step is thinking about it and even if you say there is a possibility that you or the group of people you work with will have this unconscious bias is is a really good start and um you know, I think my experience of seeing industry and perhaps working in, you know, various organizations, I, I think things have got much better than, say, 20, 20 plus years ago. But there are still, you know, nodes of things where people are just, oh, no, we, we are all the same. And, you know, if you're you know, recruiting people and you're a bunch of 60 plus year old, you know, white males, you tend to be biased to saying that is the the model we must recruit so so organizations like the you know the era society with the diversity and uh, inclusion initiatives is really great just raising these issues um university of bristol for instance has set up uh, you know a number of support groups and 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 again it's just talk, if, if people see okay here's here's someone who looks the same as me and hannah's has achieved this it's just great, you know, because otherwise we're just missing out so many people that we could include in this, you know, for the great careers that there are in engineering. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. It, uh, we were just awarded um, the mm. top prize as a PEI for uh, diversity and inclusivity, our action to uh, address it. And in our submission, 
we also included some work we'd done on mental health, aircrew mental health in particular. And um, I think the, the, in many sectors now of professional life, we talk about equality, diversity and inclusion. And if you think about that equality part, then that embraces um, a broader thinking about the results of what it is you're doing and how they're seen in terms of an individual's place in the organization and the organization's place against others. So if you think about it as an equality thing as well, and a lot of public uh, departments now are, uh, are putting it that way, I think that um, that gives you a much broader spectrum of both understanding and action that you need to take. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, thanks for, uh, like you said, around bringing up the, the series that we're doing here, talking together, is the, the cornerstone of it is really bringing, we, we've had people from the LGBTQ plus community, we're getting our, our Rolls Royce, we have uh, committees around uh, minorities in professional uh, STEM, and they're, they're taking part and really trying to get that all those perspectives in. So when the STEM industry is, is white male dominated, it, that, that's just a fact at the moment so it's important that a series like this um mm. really brings together lots of groups because everyone will have different perspectives on how it impacts them and their yeah. progression so uh, yeah As we it's, before, it's also bring it's together. also it's also good to hear that uh people have started acknowledging that unconscious or subconscious bias does exist mm. and yeah mm. acknowledging it is a first step to maybe putting something in place that prevents that bias from like you said, keeping this this hive mind together, allowing diversity to, yep. to expand. And yeah, it's great to hear. Absolutely. And um, I think the next question is, is nicely sort of couples with the just the last one is around nearly everyone um, at some stage will suffer self-doubt or imposter syndrome. And it's really, you know, have, how do you deal with that? imposter syndrome that you sometimes feel maybe that's because you look different you, you maybe live your life a different way or you're a young professional engineer who just is in a room and just doesn't feel like you belong there even though you've got the degree and you've got maybe the internship you just don't quite feel like you're fitting in um what's your kind of views on that as seniors well i i don't believe that anybody doesn't suffer from self-doubt at some time during their life uh, some people may appear you know overtly loud and always confident uh you know and uh but um you know i i suspect that underneath there's this oh am i am i really sure i i certainly have felt many times thinking well you know am i doing the right thing with my life uh you know and should i be here i mean first time i i spoke at an international conf conference and there was like oh i don't know 120 people in the audience and that was like that was really scary and then i realized that the four top people in the world in my area was sat in the front row which was even even scarier then you know because i hadn't really got to meet them but um but you've you know wherever you are in your career you've got you've got to try and use it in a, a reflective mode yeah, everyone's got to start somewhere so you know brian and i were starting our careers some some years ago so you've got to almost say well okay what did I, you know, I, I find that if I look back at my career and think, okay, 10 years ago, I was really worried about this, but, but, and that's where I thought, but now look where I've got to. And so you've got to, you know, I think, I think reflecting on, on, on life and saying, well, you know, these are the things I've done. And as you say, you've got the right qualifications and it's just that next step of how do I, how do I apply them? It's, it's like being a lecturer. I remember going to the first lecture being really, really, really really nervous and happened to met, meet the head of department who said oh yeah john you're doing your first lecture you've got to remember the the abc and xyz of lecturing which was always be confident and examine your zip before going into the lecture room and and that was really good because for the first five minutes of giving the lecture aircraft structures too about you know wing spar design and me thinking why on earth am i here i was actually thinking about this other thing so so you've got to reflect you know and no, not everything. Again, you're going to get some wins. You're going to get some loses, but but learn from it all the time. 
Yeah, the, the, I mean, there's, there are two areas, I guess. One is reflection, as you've covered very well. The other is reinforcement. Mm. And uh, to that end, um, that can be totally informal or perhaps semi-formal. By informal, I mean the sort of groups you, uh, you mix with socially, you play football with. Um, the exact corollary for me is on a squadron. Um, you're still sitting in a crew room together, um, discussing the state of the world or whatever. And uh, there's a sense of a sense of belonging and, a, and b a sense of mutual reinforcement. And then uh, in the semi-formal area, you can't beat mentoring. And that's why uh, in the society we are expanding and continue to expand our mentoring capability. For uh, a number of years, we've had a specific mentoring um, platform available for female engineers. And um, now uh, for young people, we're trying to build that up. It was one of the things that we said right at the beginning of the initial lockdown. Um, you know, we've got to come out of this with a couple of things that are much better or that we yeah. haven't been doing. And, and mentoring for young people is certainly uh, one of them. And actually, our approach to uh, diversity amongst young people uh, is another. Um, so um, the, there does need to be some structural sense of being able to find reinforcement. And that's... I mean, in any good organization, that's what the appraisal system will do. But a lot of organizations, appraisal mm. systems aren't actually um, particularly well tailored to that. But if you have a mentor who knows you, who's been on the journey with you for a certain length of time, that's a very powerful method of reinforcement. And we, we all have doubts. And, you know, you can disagree. Um, with your mentor from time to time, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's it's probably the best method I know of overcoming the sort of problems you indicated. Brilliant. I like that. The, the two R's sort of speak reflection and reinforcement. And I think in Rolls-Royce in particular, on the reinforcement front, mentoring has really picked up. Um, both people are more willing to be mentors and people are understanding the benefits of being a mentee as well and it's in terms of reflection i guess it's quite easy to get caught up in your own thoughts and, and start overthinking thinking oh actually i could have done this better am i as good as my colleague here which is why the reinforcement is is really useful mm. to hear someone much more experienced than you tell you yeah this is this is exactly how you should be thinking um in fact uh, it's, it's probably better to be a little bit more towards the self-doubt rather than the arrogant side of the spectrum um because at least it means you're there um to learn, to continue learning. But I, I have that, for instance, with, with P, PhD students who, you know, it's a three, three and a half year course of study, like like a marathon. Mm. And yeah. I know that the really, the, the really good students after three months or so will say in a tutorial, well, am I doing enough work? <laughs> you know, and I'm far happier with them saying that because they probably are. Whereas the ones who are, oh, you know, I haven't got exams, well, it's three years away. So um, <laughs> some, some self-doubt is good. But, you know, as with everything in life, within reason, it's, it's, it's a good yeah. thing. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So then the next question is about the future. So you've spoken about how um, sort of the stigma of mental health has waned away. It's not completely gone, but it's waned away. So people are more open to talking about their mental health talking about what they can do to improve their mental health. In the next five or so years, what do you think are going to be the key initiatives that organizations put into place? And also what can the new younger members that are starting to come into the engineering industry, what can they do um, to continue building on the massive improvements we've made on mental health up until today? Yeah, that's... Um... Uh, that's an interesting question in terms of the individual, but collectively, um, in many professions, the nature of work has changed because of COVID, because we found different ways of communicating with some working from home or whatever uh, in other areas. Uh, in, and, and that will be uh, prolonged because mm. it's deemed to be more efficient. It's deemed to be better for people individually. In other areas, then it's a question of returning, obviously, to the um, 
to the CAD CAM and the um, and the production line. Um, I think um, the first thing employers will have to take on board is the expectations of young people now. And we've done a lot of research in the society with the Royal Academy on Generation Z. And there are a few things that are the real drivers of attitudes for your generation. Uh, first is ethics. And so people will take a view about a company that they might work for on the base, basis of its ethical track record. Uh, environment um, clearly is a major driver. And uh, we were in one of our conferences recently to see the CEOs of aerospace companies, the CEOs of, um, of airlines, and everybody in the value chain between absolutely clear that they were not going to let up any effort on meeting the climate change challenge because their, uh, their staff demand it, the sort of people they want to recruit demand it, their investors uh, demand it. And uh, so they really have no choice, but it was good to hear that. Um, and the other is uh, a meritocracy. And uh, that's interesting because a meritocracy will only work if people interchange, talk, uh, interact, and understand the strengths and weaknesses, both collectively and individually. And that, that will be, I think, one of the biggest changes because the expectations are very high. The idea of uh, respect for hierarchy has gone completely. And some organizations will be switched on to that. They'll understand the drivers and then they'll recognize uh, the value it uh, provides for them in terms of the productivity and well-being of their employees. Others will completely reject it. And there will be the area of danger where the expectations aren't met, the pressures come on, and individuals' mental health deteriorates. But I, I'm convinced that uh, there is a, a, a real change in the importance which the good employers attach to the expectations mm. of the young people they're trying to recruit. Mm. And of course, that's going to be you know really good for the company in that if the workforce is all you know is working well together and and people not suffering from overwork or mental health problems, it's it's got to be a good thing all round. But but not easy. Um, we've talked a lot in this this conversation about the, the the joys or otherwise of being sat at home due to COVID. But I think we're not going to suddenly jump back to the way we were. We're going to end up with some sort of blended way of working. And I think. That's, that's going to cause some stress for, for companies and also, you know, workers. Do we, do we need all this expensive office space in London? You know, whereas people have shown for the last six months they can quite happily, happily work at home. And uh, with that, working from home can mean uh, different, like you say, ways of living and doing the day. Mm. Our final question is a, is a little more fun Um so short one, what's your favorite comfort food at the end of maybe a harder day or something that you go to when you just want to think, oh, I'll go and have that because that, uh, that gets me into a, a good space. I've earned it. <laughs> well, okay. So, so my sort of default, I thought, thought about this would, would be like, you know, some sort of flapjack or something, you know, <laughs> snaffled on the way home, which of course he's shouldn't be having before evening meal. Uh, but talking to my two kids who were 16 and 17 and they immediately said crumble so oh. if i if i'm ever if i'm ever doing sunday lunch or it's like uh, you know early in the week you know it's a cold miserable day right you know, so my signature dish is, is like apple or whatever fruit is available crumble so i guess that's that's my real comfort food and with oh, custard okay. rather than cream but hey yeah, always with custard always with uh, custard <laughs> Yeah, that's an easy question for me. It, it's curry in any shape or form, uh, <laughs> any time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Because it is, uh, it is interesting. There's some science around it that, um, yeah, comfort foods in moderation can actually uplift people's mental health and well-being. Mm. Because it links to maybe childhood and, and memories. Yeah. 
Um, and it's really uh, quite fascinating research on that, um, as long as it's within a, a healthy and balanced diet. Yeah, sure. It's always a good question. Yeah, but we but, talked about, you know, our mental health and we've talked about getting out and doing exercise, but you know, eating well is, is another yeah, obvious exactly. one as well. Well, uh, thank you both for really a fantastic insight into your perspectives on some of these questions around mental health and well-being and coming together to, to talk together, which is the essence of the, of the series uh, as professionals in the STEM industry and, and seniors. Um, and it's really interesting to see how it's evolved and changed over your careers. Um, and that's something that especially people that watch this that are starting out, you, you've gone through this and, and just like they will now, um, it's always important to reference people that have, have been there and done it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so great topics, uh, I think we've discussed around loneliness, dealing with disappointment and also the uncertainties that can come with a, with a professional career. So a massive uh, thank you from, from us, myself and Bavik, for, for yeah, joining us today, um, Jonathan and Sabrian. And if you've enjoyed this webinar, please do look out for, for more content in the Talking Together series. We've got uh, a current interview that's going to be uploaded with the IMEC president, Terry Spool, so you get to see his perspective from, a, from another institute. And um, all the links can be found in the uh, in the bio for all the other content. If you have got any queries or questions, feel free to email the institute. And there are support links for mental health and well-being in the in the bio as well through the society and the IMECI. So thank you very much to all that have watched, and uh, and take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.